This is the land of Havilah, Matthew 9. After Jesus got disinvited from the other side of the Sea of Galilee, verse 1, he entered into a boat and crossed over and came into his own city. Behold, they brought to him a man who was paralyzed, lying on a bed. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, cheer up, your sins are forgiven you. But some of the scribes said to themselves, This man blasphemes. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, or to say get up and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up and take up your mat and go to your house. He arose and departed to his house. When the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Comment. In a nutshell, a man came to Jesus paralyzed and walked home. In the process, Jesus proved he had the authority to forgive sin. Some scribes were sitting there and reasoned to themselves, This man speaks blasphemy. Only God can forgive sin. Mark 2, 7. They hit the nail on the head without knowing it, that Jesus was God, John 1, 1 and Isaiah 9, 6. Those were the main points, but the details bring it alive. In verse 1, this happened, quote, in his own city, end quote, meaning it happened in Capernaum, because in chapter 4, verse 13, it said, quote, leaving Nazareth, he came and lived in Capernaum, end quote. So his own city, in verse 1, indicates Capernaum. And not only was it his own city, but for Mark, seemingly it took place in his own house, quote, when he entered again into Capernaum after some days, it was heard that he was in the house, chapter 2, verse 1. Since the healing took place in his own city, in the house, with no specification of whose house it was, it sounds very much like it was none other than Jesus' house. And it's funny that Matthew didn't mention some of these juicy details, but for the sake of brevity, he left them out. But this was the incident in which four people brought the paralytic on a cot but couldn't get into the house because no one else, there was such a crowd, no one else could fit in the door. They hauled the paralytic onto the roof, broke a hole in the roof, and let the man down through the hole to a spot in front of Jesus while he was sitting and teaching, quote, into the middle before Jesus, Luke 5, 19. No doubt as they were digging a hole in the roof, they rained down construction debris on part of the crowd, maybe on Jesus. Nobody had room to get out of the way and the air must have been filled with dust. So very much from the sounds of it, the four men dug a hole in Jesus' own roof, not that Jesus necessarily owned it, but that it was the place he stayed in Capernaum. But Jesus didn't say, God condemn you for tearing up my house. Now the landlord's probably going to evict me because of all the chaos around me. Rather, quote, seeing their faith, Jesus said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you, Luke 5:20. So it was Jesus showing a remarkable lack of worry and unflappable temperament. It was also Jesus fulfilling what he said about prayer, that if we ask something from God, God won't respond in a negative manner, that if we ask for a fish, God won't give us a snake, for example, Luke 11:11. 11, 11. The paralytic came in faith looking for a healing, and Jesus wasn't going to respond negatively to that whatsoever. It was faith that motivated him and his friends to dig the hole not a spirit of vandalism, and Jesus, being understanding, didn't react negatively. So the whole thing's a classic wonder, including being one of the many proofs that Jesus was God. Moving on, traditionally, we credit the disciple Matthew for writing this book, and coming up, he mentions himself for the first time, how Jesus found him and called him. Verse 9, As Jesus passed by from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collection office, he said to him, Follow me. He got up and followed him. As he sat in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick do. But you go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Comment. The Gospels of Mark and Luke in include this incident as well, but they call Matthew Levi, so it seems maybe Matthew was his proper name, but his, he was more commonly known as Levi. 
Being a tax collector sitting in an office, he almost certainly would have been literate so that he could keep records and correspond with the Roman authorities. He got up immediately and followed Jesus, certainly because the Spirit of God was working in him to be, to be obedient, and maybe also because he had already heard of Jesus. Since the news was already far beyond Galilee, Mark 1.28, it would be hard not to be aware of Jesus in Galilee. In verse 12, after Jesus called Matthew, Matthew hosted him in his house, Mark 2.15, and it seems it wasn't just Matthew, but Jesus almost emptied out the tax office because it says that in the house, quote, many tax collectors and sinners sat down with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him, Mark 2.15. So if so many not only left the tax office, but followed Jesus, they must have put up some help wanted signs later on at the tax office. So Jesus had a motley crew of fishermen and tax collectors and sinners, some educated, but all of them motley, and the Pharisees took exception in verse 11. Jesus quoted Hosea 6.6 6 to them, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, end quote. Jesus told them, go and learn what that means. In other words, they needed to meditate on it. If we meditate on it, it's very welcome news that salvation is by God's mercy, not by any works or sacrifice that we might make. And God desires to impart to us a knowledge of Him as He imparted to Matthew, enough that Matthew left everything and followed Jesus. Coming up, speaking of sacrifice, John the Baptist led a life of self-denial and taught his disciples to do the same. And now John's disciples want to know why it's necessary for them to sacrifice while Jesus' disciples eat, drink, and are merry. Verse 14. Then John's disciples came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch would tear away from the garment, and a worse hole is made. Neither do people put new wine in old wineskins, or else the skins would burst and the wine be spilled and the skins ruined. No, they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. Comment, Jesus said, My disciples will do nothing but celebrate while I'm with them, but when I'm gone, they'll fast like you. The metaphors of the old and new cloth and wine indicate that there's a time for everything. Different occasions call for different approaches. Anyone coming to Jesus must have a fresh mindset, realizing that he's bringing something completely new. Otherwise, he'll be destroyed, the man who comes to Jesus, like the old wineskin or old cloth. Coming up, Jesus is multitasking. While he's on the way to do one miracle, he'll do another. Verse 18. While he told these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and followed him, as did his disciples. Behold, a woman who had an issue of blood for twelve years came behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said within herself, If I just touch his garment, I will be made well. But Jesus, turning around and seeing her, said, Daughter, cheer up. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder, he said to them, Make room, because the girl isn't dead but sleeping. They were ridiculing him. But when the crowd was put out, he entered in, took her by the hand, and the girl arose. The report of this went out into all the land. Comment. The ruler's name was Jairus, not a Roman ruler, but a Jewish synagogue official, Mark 5.22. Here in Matthew, he came saying that his daughter just died, but Luke and Mark put it slightly differently. Luke says not that she was dead, but dying. And Mark says he came to Jesus and said, My little daughter is at the point of death. And that while they were on the way, some people came in the, from the house and met them, saying that it was too late. She was dead already, Mark 5.35. So we can see how different witnesses could get some of the finer points confused. 
Anyway, Jesus agreed to come to the house, but he got interrupted on the way by the woman with the issue of blood. So Jairus was standing by, watching and waiting, and if the daughter, if he was under the impression that the daughter was still alive, he was wondering if this interruption was going to be fatal for his daughter. The touching of the fringe of Jesus' garment was commonplace, quote, whenever he entered into villages or into cities or into the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well, Mark 6, 56. So the woman was just one example, and apparently when someone was healed, Jesus usually didn't even mention it, Luke 8, 45. Anyway, Jesus finally got to Jairus' house, and the daughter was dead already by that point, according to all accounts. She was about 12 years old, Luke 8, 42. It was obviously unspeakably tragic. The flute players were playing music of mourning, and the crowd was in noisy disorder outwardly, which reflected their condition inwardly that such a horrible thing could happen, such an unmitigated and irredeemable disaster. To them, Jesus was laughable. In verse 24, quote, they were ridiculing him, end quote. And someone might scoff today at words of encouragement at a Christian funeral, hearing the preaching that the believing dead are in paradise living to Christ. But the rising and living in this case took place immediately, proving that it can be done. It's not entirely clear, but it seems all this was in Jesus' adopted hometown of Capernaum, and as Jesus left the little girl's house, headed for his own house, verse 27, as Jesus passed by from there, two blind men followed him, calling out and saying, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They told him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. Their eyes were opened. Jesus strictly commanded them, saying, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread abroad his fame in all that land. Comment. The blind men followed Jesus to the house, and at first we wonder why Jesus didn't heal them right away in the street when they first started following. But then we remember that Jesus is trying to be as quiet as he can about his healings because of the crowds. He waited till he, quote, had come into the house, as verse 28 said, and the blind men were somehow able to get in behind him. Again, he said, see that no one knows about this, but they went out and spread abroad his fame in all that land. Coming up, when Jesus healed the blind men, there was a crowd at the house, and no sooner had he healed them, but verse 32, as they went out, behold, a mute man who was demon-possessed was brought to him. When the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke. The multitudes marveled, saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, By the prince of demons he casts out demons. Comment. Now coming up, Jesus takes to the road. Verse 35. Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were harassed and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest indeed is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into his harvest. Comment. It seems Jesus is the one who should have complained about being harassed with all the crowds pressing in, but he never complained about himself like that. Rather, he was moved with compassion for the people's harassment, harassment by Satan, and scattering which was confusion by Satan. Galilee was a land of deep darkness, Matthew 4.16. He told his disciples to pray for God to send shepherds and harvesters. This was almost an extension of the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we should add a tagline to it, Please send workers into the harvest. Matthew 10 is next at landofhavila.net. Matthew 10.